Hi, I'm Peoria Mayor Kathy Carlett. Thanks for joining me for another edition of Peoria Pulse. If you live in Peoria, there is no doubt you have seen rapid growth all around you. In fact, Peoria's population has grown 50% since the year 2000. And while there are many reasons to call Peoria home, the common denominator for everyone is access to 570 acres of parks, 25 miles of trails, and the natural beauty of the hills and valleys of our Sonoran Desert. This is the backdrop of our daily lives and part of the highly sought after unique character of our hometown. As we continue to grow, it is my job, along with your city council, to ensure that we hold on to the characteristics that set us apart and the history that brought us this far. While this critical responsibility is often easier said than done, we are fortunate to have experts like Mark Hackbarth, senior archaeologist with Logan Simpson, here to guide us along the way. Mark, welcome to the show. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, it's just such a pleasure to have you out here. We are here today at the beautiful Palo Verde Park, a park that I know you are very familiar with. Would you like to tell us a little bit about your history here? Sure. My involvement started in about 1996 when the uh, developer of Terramar Development said that they would like to do some archaeology. And that was because of the Corps of Engineers uh, controlled some of the waterways here. And the site that was here was known for quite some time, like 1930s. So we came out and we did a little survey, identified the boundaries of the site, and then did some investigations subsequent to that before the houses were built. And what did you find? Well, this is the largest village on the New River. And so dating to about AD 850 up to maybe as late as 1100 AD. So a couple hundred years of occupation in here. This was the Hohokam uh, village. And it probably also had smaller outlying farmsteads surrounding it. But the village center is preserved here in the city park. The greatest density of trash mounds and probably uh, underground is also the pit houses and other cooking pits related to it. Wow, that is really, really exciting. So you came out here, you did a little excavation, and you found that Hohokam villages were here dating back to what year? AD 850. <laughs> AD 850. Yes. Wow, yeah, that 1200. is incredible. That is so exciting, right in the middle of the city of Peoria. And so what did we need to do to make sure that we did not ruin the ruins. <laughs> <laughs> the city of Peoria had a very good vision when they came here. They originally wanted to do a very large 20-acre recreational park, but when they found out that there were archaeological resources here, they decided it would be better to look forward to the future of how they can use it best. And one of the things that they did is they put a small recreational park in it mm -hmm. and did archaeological excavations to recover information from the recreation area. Mm -hmm. But they also preserved about 15 acres of the archaeological site and as an open space. Uh -huh. And now we are developing a interpretive trail to go through it. Gosh, that is perfect. So here we are in the middle of an, of an urban neighborhood, suburban neighborhood, if you will, and we've got park, an area for people to bring their kids to play, and then we've got a reflective area right here where we are standing, and that feeds into open space, and now we're doing an interpretive trail. All the things that our citizens can use to benefit not only now, but for them to learn about our heritage. Huh? And it goes wider than that because we have, um, the city has put the site on the National Register of Historic Places, so it has uh, national exposure. And people do come and do heritage tourism and they want to see things and this is one of the locations to come to. Wow. The city has interpretive trail uh, and signage already in the recreational park as well. Well, that's pretty amazing and it's, it's an asset then not only for the citizens of Peoria but nationwide. Yes. Oh, tremendous. So let's talk a little bit about land ownership because the city of Peoria owns this land now, but we didn't always. Um, and as a matter of fact, a lot of the land in our state uh, and elsewhere is owned by the, the state and, and federal governments and some private development. So how does that impact us preserving our heritage? A little history. Uh, this land was part of the land that was given to the state upon its uh, 1912 birth. Okay. But someone came along and said, hey, I've got an idea for a homestead. So they patented the land. And from the 1920s up until the 1930s, they ran it as a uh, dry farm ranch. And then for the longest time, it was just open vacant land being used for ranching. Uh, 
Um, and then about the 1990s, the developer for Terramar came in, bought the land and started to develop it using the zoning that the city had in place. And it also, they also had to obey the uh, Corps of Engineers mm -hmm. because the Corps of Engineers said several of these washes flowed sufficiently that they had to control the waters that go downstream. Mm -hmm. So the land goes from public ownership to private ownership to public back again. Uh -huh. And what we've done is able to preserve this by judicious use of it. And so the ownership in other locations throughout the city that might be private can also be treated this way. You can get easements given to a public entity to preserve archaeological sites or natural environmental things mm -hmm. as well. Or of course purchase them. Or purchase them. Yes. <laughs> the city of Peoria created a book uh, called the Sonoran Preservation Program and I think that you were you played a part in that didn't you? Yes. Tell me a little bit about what you did uh, with the Sonoran Preservation Program and how that affects us as we move forward. Okay. The vision for the program was really to in integrate all kinds of resources, not just cultural resources. So the city looked at visual, water, wildlife, air quality, land resources, um, irrigation, transportation, all of these variables that go in to make up any city and planned out what would be the best use for land. Mm -hmm. How would you make a city work the most efficiently? Mm -hmm. And what would you need to make people happy? And they invited people in for stakeholder meetings and said, what do you need in your neighborhood? That type of thing. And that kind of planning is necessary because then everybody gets a seat at the table and gets to have their ideas heard out. And it improves it. And that's what happened with this. Uh, there are basically intersecting uh, op open areas that were used for wildlife corridors, but also has water resources in it, and also cultural resources. So you get a three, four, one mm -hmm. type of thing. And that type of planning is essential. So without that kind of planning, growth can just happen anywhere. Yes. Rooftops upon rooftops upon shopping centers and shopping centers, right? Right. And it's inefficient that way. If you start having strip malls everywhere, you, you need to have them concentrated or put where people are going to get access to them. Yeah. And that kind of planning is very good. And it deals with the cultural resources then too about preservation in place. And that is how we maintain the unique character that really is the city of Peoria. As we grow, it, you know, there's going to be a lot of balancing that we have to do. Do you have any advice for us? <laughs> <laughs> well, the archaeological sites have been here sometimes for thousands of years, and it's easy to forget that they're there because sometimes they're not highly visible. But when you know where they are, the best thing is to avoid them. Put them into open space or to put a protective easement on them so that they don't get developed over. Uh, it's also the cheapest way to do things because you're not involved with excavation and recovery. Uh, if you look at archaeological sites as abandoned, you're not seeing the reality of it. Uh, the Native American community believes that their ancestors are still here. And so when you do data recovery to move the archaeological resources off so you can build a housing development on it, you still have to deal with the archaeological remains, including human remains. And so to have those uh, removed is expensive but they do go home then to descendant communities afterwards as well. Oh, that's very interesting. I understand that you were part of the team that actually did some um, excavation of human remains in Phoenix. Yes, um, most of the archeological sites that I work on are habitation sites, and prehistoric, and there are uh, burials often associated with that. I've also worked at the uh, first historic cemetery in Phoenix at around 5th to 7th Avenue and Madison Street. So there were human remains there as well that had to be recovered and reburied. You had to excavate them and rebury them? Yes. <laughs> oh my goodness. That's uh, part of the state burial law is whether human remains are not property. You cannot own human remains. Okay. So they go back to descendant communities. You have a very interesting job. It's a lot of fun. I'll bet that it is. Well, thank you so much for coming today and for being a part not only of, of this today, but of the history of the city of Peoria. We so appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Peoria is only halfway built out, and as the pressures of growth continue to mount, we must commit to ensuring our most precious lands and cultural areas, just like these, are safeguarded and accessible for future generations. In doing so, we will help keep our property values high, and we will better manage the growth that we know is going to come. 
all while doing our part to protect Peoria's heritage for generations to come. To learn more about open space, including Peoria's Sonoran Preservation Program, visit our planning department's website. Thank you for joining me today for another edition of Peoria Pulse.